Welcome to this new appointment with the Torvigada Astrophysics Seminars. Today we have the pleasure to host uh, Dr. Margarita Giustini, who is one of the most distinguished scientists in uh, the AGN community. And <clears throat> just to tell you a little bit about her, her career, she started her career in Bologna, where she got uh, her PhD and then uh, began to work as a researcher at ENEF. Then she traveled a lot, actually. She first moved to the United States, then she uh, moved to Spain, where she worked at the European Space Agency. Then she uh, moved to Netherlands, working for, at the Institute for Space Research, and finally landed once again in Spain, where she's currently working as a researcher at the CAB, Centro de Astrobiología, I hope this is the right pronunciation, in uh, Madrid. And today <clears throat> she will tell us about these recently discovered X-ray phenomenon, that is uh, quasi-periodic eruptions. And the talk will be 45 minutes long. Margarita, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Francesco for inviting me today to tell you uh, the results about this uh, quite amazing story of this uh, of this discovery. First of all, uh, I would like to thank some uh, really fundamental people involved uh, in this story who actually provided most of the observational results that I will show you today. So Giovanni Minuti from the Centro di Astrobiologia and uh, Richard Saxton from the XMM Newton Science Operations Center in Madrid, and also Ricardo Arcodia, who just got his PhD from MPE together with Andrea Merloni. Uh, Erin Cara from MIT and uh, Johin Chakraborty, who is an undergrad student at Columbia University. And the main results that I will uh, show you today uh, are presented in these four uh, articles, uh, which I will reference through, go through, through the seminar. So uh, this is the story of a serendipitous discovery, uh, completely serendipitous discovery of a new cosmic phenomenon for which we actually uh, have a name, but not a completely clear uh, physical explanation yet. It's surely it's telling us something important about supermassive black hole accretion into low mass galaxies, but they could hold the key to measure even the black hole mass, uh, the black hole spin, sorry, in a completely independent manner from spectral modeling and might be detected in gravitational wave from space at some point in the future. So I'm speaking of quasi-periodic eruptions of X-rays or QPEs. This story starts in the nucleus of this galaxy, which is called GSN 069. It's at a redshift 0 0.014, uh, more or less in the direction of the South Galactic Pole, but uh, 250 million light years away from Earth. Uh, this was a galaxy mm, not particularly famous uh, until uh, a few years ago. In fact, in the X-rays, it was not even detected. So this is a plot that shows the uh, X-ray flux, the soft X-ray flux between 300 electron volt and 2 kilo electron volt versus time. And ROSAT uh, uh, is a German satellite who performed a null sky survey in the 90s, did not detect the source and provided upper limits on the soft X-ray flux of the order of 10 to the minus 14 hertz per second per centimeter square. Then 16 years later, more or less, the source become uh, noteworthy, uh, just to say for the X-ray astronomers, wh when it was suddenly detected by the European satellite XMM-Newton while it was performing a slew between an observation and another and suddenly detected uh, a flux which was uh, over 200 times larger than the upper limits uh, provided by Rosat 16 years earlier. Uh, immediately, the satellite pointed again at the source and also the SWIFT satellite started monitoring the, the source of the course over the course of the following um, years, almost a decade. Now, the decay in uh, soft X-ray flux during the years uh, was consistent with the with a quite long-lived tidal disruption event, meaning the increasing X-ray flux between the Rosat passage over the source and the XMM-Newton passage over the galaxy, and the subsequent decline in X-ray flux 
are consistent with the energy released due to the partial or to, to, to the complete disruption of a large star, which orbited too close to the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. These are the three pointings uh, of XMM Newton that I will show you uh, in a second, which were performed the first right after the discovery of the SLU, the second in 2014, and then in 2018, two uh, very, very closely spaced pointings, which in this graph just uh, overlap together uh, with the red point. So this is what XMM Newton observed from this source. Uh, on the bottom, you can see the light curve, what extra astronomy called the light curve of the source. So it's a it's a it's a graph with the count rate uh, observed versus time. And in 2010, uh, during the first XMM Newton pointing, which was quite short, about three hours, the source was mm, not very different from uh, what you observe usually from active galactic nuclei, meaning it displayed some kind of variability, which was quite random, uh, with quite unpredictable and random fluctuations about some average. Then four years later, it was observed again uh, for a much longer time. This time it was almost a complete uh, day of observation. And uh, again, the light curve did not look anything exceptional compared to known AGN, except for a remarkably stable level of observed flux during the whole day of observation. So there was no really marked variability. But something completely different was observed at the end of 2018. And in fact, it, that was some, something very different from any light curve that was observed from any extragalactic X-ray source. XMM Newton was observing again the source together with Hubble to try to investigate some peculiar spectral behavior of the source. And this is what it observed. So two sharp and symmetric bursts of X-ray emission were detected in the light curve of GSN069, and the count rates were over one order of magnitude higher than the quiescence level, so the level of flux which is stable at around 0.4 counts per second. So immediately we asked for a longer uh, observation with XMM Newton using the director discretionary time, and one full orbit was performed uh, less than one month after this observation. And this is what we observed uh, during this new XMM Newton pointing. Uh, this happened during the 16th and 17th of January of 2019, and uh, a series of very rapid and recurrent bursts of X-ray emission were detected. They were lasting about half an hour each and were repeating about every nine hours. This animation is based on real data, but it's speed up uh, about 5,000 times. And it shows the epic PN image uh, of GSN069 on the top right corner and the simultaneous X-ray light curve at the bottom. So X-ray quasi-periodic eruptions were uh, a, a true phenomenon, so to speak. And they got this, this uh, name just to distinguish them from the quasi-periodic oscillations, which are often observed in, uh, close to black holes, but are much more gentle variations and are nothing similar to this uh, I would say, dramatic uh, flares of emission. So this is a collection of uh, light curves of GSN 069 taken from uh, 2010 until May 2019. So right after the XMM Newton confirmation of the new phenomenon in January 2019, the visibility window uh, of the source was, clo was closing and uh, we asked very rapidly uh, for a new Chandra observation in this case, which is shown here in, uh, in green, which was coordinated with various uh, ground-based radio facilities in order to test the possible radio connection uh, for the X-ray QPEs. And the Chandra observation detected three uh, further QPEs uh, during a span of about one day. So uh, in May 2019, the XMM Newton visibility window opened again and the satellite observed another five QPEs during one full orbit, shown here uh, in yellow. So GSN 069 was uh, emitting an average of three QPEs per day. And given the time scale involved, uh, it's uh, really hard to think to something different from uh, accretion onto, onto massive uh, black holes. And this will become clear later when we will speak also about the luminosities involved. 
Now, if we look at the uh, at the light curves during the, the QPEs, uh, it's already visible by eye that the, the intensity, uh, it's not really constant. But uh, there is an, alter an alternation, there is a pattern of alternating QPEs with the higher uh, and lower intensity. And the same can be said for the recurrence time between QPEs. So the time separation between consecutive uh, bursts of emission is not really constant but it's oscillating up and down uh, around an average value of about nine hours. In particular, if you focus here on the two high quality and very long XMM Newton observations of GSN 069 performed in 2019, <coughs> you can see uh, in, the, in the bottom panels, the amplitude and the recurrence time plotted as a function of, of time. So each point represents one QP. And you can see that in both cases, the amplitude of the QP is oscillating up and down, and the same is doing the recurrence time. So this is probably speaking about something uh, orbital, mm, one would think, sorry. <clears throat> but uh, let's say, let's go look, how do the QP look like? So which kind of spectral information did we get? From, from these XMM Newton observations. Uh, let's focus first on the quiescence spectral shape of the source. So forget about the QPs and uh, we show here the spectra extracting only during quiescence from 2010 until uh, February 2019. And the order is from black to blue to green to red, sorry, to green. So the spectra of GS069 are extremely soft. So most of the photons are emitted below one kilo electron volt, while usually AGN have very strong extra emission above uh, 2 kV. They are usually actually defined by their power low emission uh, between 2 and 10 kilo electron volt, which in this case is almost absent. So there is a contribution from a hard X-ray power law, but very, very low compared to what is observed uh, in active galactic nuclei. The spectral shape is thermal-like, so it, lo it looks like a, like a black body. And if you fit the spectrum as, uh, with a black body, assuming that it comes from the thermal emission from a disk surrounding a black hole, you get a quite low black hole mass of about 400,000 uh, solar masses, which is at the very low end of supermassive black hole uh, observed uh, masses. And on the right plot, uh, you can see the corresponding theoretical models who fit the, the spectra which are shown in the left. And again, the spectra are, th are thermal and the hard X-ray power law contribution is very, very low. But how do the QP looks like instead? So this is a plot which show the merged profile of the QPs. So the long baseline observation uh, of XMM Newton performed due to, in 2019 allow to perform phase resolved spectroscopy on the data set. So all the QPs were merged and these uh, were the results. In the left panel, you can see the phase resolved profile of the QPs in three different energy bands with the lowest energy in red, the medium energy band in green, and then the highest energy in blue. And it's immediately clear that the amplitude of QPs is much higher at higher energies reaching uh, almost a factor of 100 between 800 electron volt and 1 kilo, kilo electron volt. While at the lowest energy, the amplitude is quite low, below a factor of 5. On the right panel, the same energy profiles have been normalized to the peak value in order to emphasize the difference in profile for different energies. And it can be seen uh, very clearly that at lower energies, the, Q, the QPs are much broader, so they last longer. And also the peak of arrival, so the time of arrival of the QPs happens much earlier at higher energies compared to the medium and to the uh, low energies. The, the phase result spectroscopy allowed to perform also uh, to follow the, evolu the temporal evolution of the QPs. And uh, this is the, the results that we, that were get and um, in the 
in this small panel on the left, you can see the average profile of the QP, which was divided in five in seven different segments. So the QP peak is in blue, and then there is the pre-burst in red, followed by two rising phases in yellow and green, and then there are two decay phases after the peak, again in green and yellow, and then the post-burst in red. And in the large panels, you can see the corresponding spectrum. So the temporal order is first this red spectrum here, pre-burst, and then the QP starts in yellow, the flare rises in green and arrives at the peak in blue. And then from the peak, it starts to decay in green to the yellow. And then after the peak, the, the burst is gone. Again, it has a, a red thermal spectrum at low energy. So QPEs look like very smooth oscillations that are between this uh, softer quiescent state in red and a much harder blue state uh, at the peak of the eruption. And there is no, mm, let's say, no abrupt spectral transition between these states. But again, it's, it's, it's a quite smooth or fitted to the thermal component of the spectrum. And uh, uh, on the right, the corresponding lu luminosity. So when it, the spectrum is modeled with the thermal component, the temperature oscillates back and forth between about five, between about 50 electron volt in quiescence and um, 100 electron volt at the peak. While the luminosity oscillates between a quiescence level, which is uh, of the order of two times 10 to the 41 ergs per second, to the peak up to the about three times 10 to the 42 ergs, ergs per second. And it is clear that such luminosities uh, cannot be associated to stellar stellar like objects, nor to stellar mass black holes, but some sort of uh, non stationary accretion onto supermassive black hole must be involved. So, uh, to summarize what was observed in GSN uh, during uh, 2018 and 2019, uh, where recurrent bursts of emission which lasted about one hour and were repeating more or less three times per day, with an alternating, alternating long and short recurrence time between bursts and low and high amplitude. These oscillations are smooth and correspond with, uh, to two accretion flow states, one colder and quiescent of, and one warmer and uh, bursting. And each burst releases more or less 10 to the 42 x per second. Uh, at the peak. And it's also worth noting that the, the, the host galaxy properties, because the, the, the galaxy was likely powered by a TDE event, so a tidal disruption event, and it showed also in quiescence a very, super, a very soft X-ray spectrum, quite uh, unusual for a, for a standard active galactic nucleus. So shortly after the discovery of QPEs in GSN 069, we turned back our attention to the literature and to the archive. A few active galaxies caught the attention, uh, again, for displaying basically these properties. So uh, super soft X-ray spectra, interesting variability, and some kind of association to tidal disruption events. And among the candidates, uh, RxJ1301 0.9 plus 2747 or RxJ for short uh, was uh, without doubt was the best candidate, was the best candidate for sure. Uh, RxJ is physically located in the outskirts of the comma cluster. So it is a redshift of about 0 0.02 and it belongs to a small uh, group uh, of galaxy in the outskirts of the, of the cluster. And contrary to GSN 069, uh, RxJ is a very well-known uh, X-ray source. In fact, was, uh, very, it was detected by ROSAT in the 90s, which provided already light curves uh, and spectra. So on the left here, you can see the ROSAT spectrum of the source uh, taken in 1991, and uh, the spectrum is super soft again. So above 1 kV, there are no counts. Well, the satellite didn't have uh, a large collective area above those energy, but the spectrum is super steep. So uh, this would classify the source as a super soft uh, X-ray AGN. And in the central panel, you can see the light curves of ROSAT, which uh, are full of gaps because of the orbit of the satellite. 
But even with the gaps, some interesting behavior could be seen, especially in the third panel. Uh, at around three times 10 to the four seconds, you can see a very sharp drop in X-ray count rate over a very, very short uh, time scale. And uh, being in the field of the coma cluster, the source was already observed by XMM Newton in 2000. And this was the light curve, which was published by Sun, Xu, and Wang in 2013. And after, uh, I mean, after uh, having seen what QPs look like, there was really no doubt in recognizing such features. So a new XMM Newton director discretionary time observation was performed, and uh, these were the results. So in the left panel, you can see the archival observation that I just shown you. And in the in the central panels here, in the larger panels, the new observation performed in 2019. So three new uh, QPEs uh, were detected in the nucleus of RxJ1301. And um, in the top row, you can see the observed count rate in black for the EPIC PN, which is a much larger collecting area, and in red and green for the two EPIC MOS cameras, which have a much a uh, smaller collecting area, but usually are opened first, so they start their observations earlier. And you can see this allowed in this case to catch the beginning of, uh, of a QPE in 2000, which was not detected by the, the other camera. And in the bottom panel, you can see the count rate divided by the quiescent level, so the, the resulting amplitude of the QPEs. So the three uh, QPs detected in 2019 were very intense, uh, especially the last one. Uh, it, had the, it had the largest amplitude observed, and the, their duration was very short, um, of the order of just half an hour each, so about a half of GSN 069. And uh, about the recurrence time between QPs, uh, while there is a possible uh, long and short alternating behavior, uh, nothing more can be said because there is no clear recurring pattern. There is no uh, identifiable uh, equal time separation between any of the couples of the QPs, nor in 2000, nor in 2019. And uh, spectrally, uh, RxJ is very, very similar to GSN 069. In this left panel, you can see the quiescent spectrum in magenta and the QP spectrum in blue during 2000. And in the central panel, you can see the quiescent spectrum in black and the QP spectrum in red for the 2019 observation. And in the right panel, there are the corresponding best fitting theoretical models with a thermal component in the soft band and a power low emission, which emerges uh, at around one kilo electron volt. And in blue and red, the two QP spectra, in blue the 2000 and in red the 2019. So while the spectra are very similar to the GSN 069, the, um, there are some differences between the 2000 and 2019 uh, observations. The, the quiescence is constant. So the, in, in particular, the temperature of the thermal component used to, to model the quiescence is constant during the 19 years elapsed between the observations at about uh, 50 electron volt. But at around one kilo electron volt, there, there are much, many more photons in 2019 compared to 2000. So there is a, a variation in quiescence, meaning that there must be either a power low component emerging or some sort of warmer component which contributes a little bit to the quiescence uh, in 2019 compared to 2000. But the, the most evident differences are between the QP spectra because the QP spectrum in uh, 2000 is uh, best fitted by a thermal component with a, a 100 electron volt temperature, while in 2019 the temperature needed to fit the spectrum is higher, of the order of uh, 25 electron volt uh, higher. So this um, could be uh, an evolution of the QPs uh, during these 19 years, but also it might be the result of different different temperature of the individual QPs. As I shown you before, the last QP in 2019 was uh, very very intense, and this might uh, bias the the merge spectrum of the QPs. 
And this is very hard to say uh, with this observation as the numbers involved are very, very small, as we are speaking in this case of just uh, 4.5 QPs in total. But uh, what can be said for sure is that these QPEs in RxJ seems to be present over the course of uh, almost two decades. So uh, uh, very long uh, timescales of observations. And this is a summary of the properties of the four, Q, four complete QPs which were observed in RxJ until 2019. And the amplitude is comparable to the one of GSN069, but the duration again is much shorter. Uh, about a half of the duration of the QPs of, of GSN069. And in particular at high energies, so above uh, more or less 900 electron volt, the duration of this phenomenon is, is very, very short, just of the order of 15 minutes or, or 20 minutes. There is also a delay in the, in the time of the arrival of QPs at low energies compared to high energy as there is in GSN069, and it's quite significant because it's, uh, it can be up to 10 minutes uh, at the lowest energies compared to the, to the highest. And all the QPs uh, observed in RxJ uh, are plotted together in this plot, observed by the EPIC PN, so the four complete QPs, for uh, different energies sliced. So the energy is growing from top to the bottom, and uh, it's, uh, it's clear that the amplitude is varying for the different energy bands because you look at the, at the y-axis, the amplitude is very different in the different panels. So the maximum amplitude is around between 700 electron volt and 1000 electron volt. And um, the time of arrival is also quite different. So the shaded area emphasizes the time of arrival at the highest energies. And if you look at the lowest QP, energies QPs, they still have to fully develop when they are already gone at high energies. So this is what we observed in RxJ until um, July 2019. And while we were studying the properties of the QPs uh, in these two AGN, um, the Irosita was doing uh, was doing its job. So um, Irosita is a German satellite on board the Russian-German mission SRG and was launched in uh, July 2019. It started performing the first deep survey of the X-ray sky in December 2019 and uh, shortly after provide the first two candidates uh, of, of QPs. So uh, Irosita surveys the, uh, the sky moves, um, let's see, um, uh, each point which is pointed by each in the sky which is pointed by Rosita is, is seen every for about 40 seconds every about four hours which is the amount of time of one Rosita revolution about the earth and this is the length of one Rosita day so four hours every four hours Rosita can see the same position in the sky and a very smart selection strategy was applied to the data flow uh, coming from Rosita which is uh, massive permitting to isolate two variable signals which were of clear extragalactic origin. And so the first QPs uh, detected by Rosita had been discovered. The first in this galaxy at 0 0.05 in redshift, uh, named for short Eero QP1, and the second in this galaxy at lower redshift named Eero QP2. These are the two light curves observed by Rosita of the two sources. So each point is taken at one Erosita day, so spaced uh, by about four hours. And in both cases, while the signal was most of the time consistent with the background in red, there were multiple time bins where the signal was much higher and repeating. So immediately the, the, the sources were pointed again with uh, much larger and sensitive telescopes which we can um, observe for much longer baseline and uh, also optical spectra were, were, were taken from the literature and with surprise uh, of almost everybody I would say the both of QPs were happening in quiescent galaxies so the optical spectra of the galaxy are shown here and displayed 
zero signs of previous nuclear uh, activity due to accretion. So these were completely quiescent galaxies before the Erosita discovering of their QPs. These are the light curves uh, taken by the nicer instrument on top uh, and from, taken with XMM Newton on bottom of the two QPs discovered by Erosita. So in the first case, the time scale between peaks is very, very long. So the, the separation in time between each peak is of the order of 18 hours or 15 hours, depending on the, on the flares. So it was impossible to monitor uh, continuously with XMM Newton, but NICER on board the International Space Station was the, the right instrument. And it allowed to detect uh, many, many flares, and all these results are reported in the, in the paper by, by Ricardo Arcodia. And um, the bursts are very long in this case, so they last almost eight hours each, and they release a tremendous amount of energy compared to the other QPs as well, uh, almost one order of magnitude uh, higher than others. Then in the bottom panel, you can see the light curve of Hero QP2, which is uh, much different from the one above and much more similar to the one of GSN 069, meaning that the, the, the flares are very sharp, are very symmetric, and they, are, uh, they repeat every just a few hours. Actually, the, the recurrence time between these QPs is much shorter than the recurrence time between the QPs of GSN 069. So these two QPs expand the recurrence time uh, of the QPs in both sides of the parameter space very, very nicely. And for HeroQP2, you can also see by eyes that there is a similar behavior as the one observed in GSN, GSN 069 of an alternating uh, large and small and large and small amplitude uh, of the QPs. And if you look carefully at the light curve, you can see that the same uh, pattern of also alternating short, long, short, long recurrence time is present uh, in this source. These are the spectra observed for these two Erosita Q QPs, which again are super soft. So most of the photons are emitted below one kilo electron volt. On the top, you can see the Erosita spectra, while uh, in the bottom, you can see the follow up uh, epic PM spectra. In uh, both cases, the hard X-ray power law is absent uh, or negligible. And in both cases, again, there is a, a substantial spectral hardening during the QPs, which can be seen here. So the, the quiescence level is in, is in brown for QP1 and QP2 here. And then the flare is in yellow and green for the first observation and just green for the second one, which caught one single QP. And again, there is a substantial hardening uh, of the spectra during the QP, as observed in the other sources. Uh, one thing that can be also noticed uh, by eye is the much uh, higher energy reached by the QPs in Hero QP1. So the temperature which fits this thermal component is much higher than the temperature that fits the, the thermal component of other QPs like uh, Hero QP2s. These are this, the two plots which show the continuous uh, evolution in time of the spectral parameters, which can describe the spectra of the two Erosita QPs. On the left, EroQP1, and on the right, EroQP2. In both cases, um, results are taken from long XMM Newton observations. And again, the spectral evolution during and after the QPs is very smooth. There are no uh, dramatic spectral transitions happening. And in the case of uh, EROQP1, the energy output is very, very large. In the case of EROQP2, the behavior is very similar to the one of GSN069. So the oscillations are very, very rapid and uh, are between a phase which is of the order of 50 electron volt in quiescence and then of the order of 100 electron volt in, uh, at the peak. And, and again, the energy release is comparable to the one of GSN 069. There is a fifth candidate uh, hosting QPs, uh, which was recently discovered by Johin Chakraborty, 
uh, after a very clever method was uh, applied to an existing algorithm which was used to detect uh, uh, exoplanets and it was applied backwards to the full XMM Newton archive. And this galaxy was identified. Uh, it has a long name, so we call it J0249 for short. Mm. And similar to the other galaxy, which are hosting QPEs, it has a quite low stellar mass content and it is associated to some kind of uh, tidal disruption event. Um, this on the top is the light curve of the source, which was detected similar to GSN069 by the SLU uh, XM Newton uh, in, uh, 2004, in 2004, after a non-detection of Rosat in the 90s, and was immediately followed up with SWIFT in green here and in red, uh, because it was a tidal disruption event candidate, meaning again, this sudden increase in X-ray flux between the Rosat pointing and the, and the, the XMM Newton's slew could have been uh, due to the energy release due to the disruption of a star. And indeed, the decay in flux during the years is quite compatible with what you would expect theoretically from such a scenario. And when the algorithm was applied to the XMM Newton archive, the, this light curve was isolated. So there is a signal in 2006, which is this observation here where 1.5 flares, uh, because a half of the flare is just at the end of the observation, uh, are caught uh, by the instruments on board the XMM Newton. And the amplitude is much lower uh, than the amplitude observed in the QPs in G GSN, in RxJ, on, in uh, Erosita QPs. And for this reason, it's, it's most probably uh, much more difficult to identify. Following this discovery, uh, a new XMM Newton observation was triggered immediately to check for the presence of QPs, and it was performed uh, in August 2021. And these were the results, again, in terms of light curves, so flux observed versus time. And uh, the QPs were not present anymore, at least uh, within this time separation, so uh, between 32 kiloseconds. And this, the source was still detected in the X-rays with a quite uh, constant uh, flux level over the, over the course of the, of the full observation. Spectrally, um, these signals look um, very much like the one of GSN and RxJ. So on the left here, you can see the spectra in 2006 when, when there was this QPE-like flare, which was modeled in red here compared to the quiescence in blue. So again, during this flare, there is a hardening of the spectrum. This is the, the spectrum corresponding to the new observation when the QPs are gone, and the source is very well detected in the X-rays, and especially a hard X-ray power law component seems to have developed during the 15 years elapsed, elapsed between the, the observations. So all in all, uh, this source looks very much like uh, another TDE hosting galaxy. And if we put uh, together uh, all the um, observation that we got so far, we get to these uh, average properties of these five systems hosting QPs. So on the left panel, you can see the average duration of these flares uh, versus the average recurrence time between them. And uh, as you can see, the duration is, is dramatically long in Eero QP1 compared to all the other uh, QPs. And also the recurrence time, it, it really stands out. The same can be, can be said for the amplitude of the QPs, uh, which is immense in uh, Eero QP1, basically because there is no quiescence. Uh, but the luminosity involved is also, uh, is also quite large. And the, on the contrary, the luminosity of the quiescence level for Eero QP1 is the lowest among the, all the QP hosting galaxies. Of course, it, it is uh, very much early to try to draw any kind of uh, correlation. These are just lines drawn to uh, help the eye to localize the outstanding location of Eero QP1 compared to the other objects. But we hope to increase the sample uh, soon.
uh, these are some just properties to, to keep, keep in mind uh, to think about the interpretation of QPs about the host galaxy properties. So all of these uh, galaxies which uh, hosted QPs uh, have a low ma mass in both stars and black hole, mm. meaning that typically the content in stellar mass is of the order 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 11 uh, stellar masses or, or less. And the black holes are smaller than 10 to the 6 solar masses, maybe even 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 much smaller than that. And all of them uh, have TDA-like uh, activity or very likely TDA-like activity. And also uh, there is no previous nuclear activity in two of the sources and all of them also all the sources which showed nuclear activity, they do not show uh, broad emission lines which are also characteristic of actively uh, and um, accreting supermassive black holes. Also, it is uh, worth noticing that both GSN069 and RxJ have clear signatures of nuclear star clusters in their nuclei, and nuclear star clusters are uh, preferential, preferential channels for the formation of intermediate mass black holes. So this also could tell us something uh, about the physical origin of QPs. But what is the physical origin of QPs? So this is the, the part which is in, still uh, far from being clear, even though some direction is, is, is being taken lately. So one possibility is uh, instabilities of the accretion flow. So something similar to what happens in stellar mass um, black holes, in binary black holes, which uh, can undergo uh, sudden and dramatic instability of the very inner portion of the of the flow and this release uh, burst of energy recurrent uh, quasi periodically like in this case uh, which is a very famous stellar mass black hole and so the observation of qps uh, reminded somehow this this phenomenon but if you look at the physics uh, of the stability of an of a, of a geometrically thin accretion disk you find out that the time scales are completely off, but completely, meaning that the, um, the time scales predicted given the black hole masses in GSS 069, for example, are much, much longer, but much, much longer, like, uh, like a- uh, I'm sorry, uh, we don't have minutes left. Oh, perfect, thank you. So these um, problems of time scales, um, tells us that this is likely not the, the physical explanation. Another possibility is a gravitational self-lensing of binary black holes. So in this sketch, you can imagine uh, two black holes uh, in the black, uh, with the black points surrounded by two mini accretion disks in red, which orbits each other. And if you observe coplanar with this interaction, you can observe uh, recurrent flares with also different and peculiar shapes depending on the geometry. But again, there are uh, considerable problems um, on the quantitative reproduction of the light curves of these sources. So again, this is not a very uh, favorite scenario at the moment. Then there are extreme mass ratio in spirals um, possibilities. So orbital phenomena, which seems to be uh, more and more likely the more observational results we, we get. Uh, I don't have really time to go deeply on this, but there are uh, very interesting uh, papers around uh, discussing these possibilities. So the, if the, the interpretation for the QPs is, is that a, a very compact object is of uh, stellar mass like uh, size is orbiting a much more massive object, so a supermassive black hole or an intermediate mass black hole, then the strong interaction will cause the system to shrink and then in the future the system is expected to merge and to produce also a strong burst of gravitational waves which could be in principle detected from space uh, during the next decade. This was also the first explanation provided somehow for GSN 069 by King in 2020 uh, where a white dwarf uh, was uh, postulated to uh, be the remnant of a partial disruption of a red giant occurred in 2010 when the source suddenly brightened up. And then the remnant, so the core, the white dwarf core of this X 
uh, red giant uh, is what remains and orbits in an extremely eccentric orbit around the central black hole, and every nine hours interact with the black hole, giving, giving a burst of emission. Even more uh, complicated explanations uh, are possible and, po and possibly are needed, like for example, two uh, MRIS, so, so two extreme mass ratio spirals, which are co-orbiting around a massive object. For the QPEs, uh, there are some um, in incredibly rich uh, potentials uh, physically speaking, because by reconstructing the the orbits of the small objects orbiting the ma more massive one, and by reconstructing them based on the time of arrival of the QPs and their deviation around the average, the space-time metric where this, these small objects are orbiting can be determined, and therefore this black hole spin can also be determined in principle in a manner which is completely independent from uh, spectral fitting and from strong uh, model assumptions. So all in all, uh, very, very promising. Uh, 